All right, Jeff, let's talk something different. Let's bring on to the show Arthur Smith, Emmy-nominated television producer, creator of shows like American Ninja Warrior, Hell's Kitchen, a much more author of the new book, Reach Hard Lessons and Learn Truths from a Lifetime in Television. Arthur, congratulations on the book. Thanks for giving us some time. Oh, my pleasure. Looking forward to it, guys. You know, reading this book and prepping for it, um, you said the stories you selected aren't necessarily the biggest or funniest. They support the message of the book. So talk to us about the message you wanted to share and how you decided you wanted to tell it. Well, you know, um, I believe in the power of reach because uh, I think when you reach, you realize uh, you find out what you're capable of. And when you reach, you realize the difference between a, a pipe dream and what you haven't dared to try just yet. So all the stories that are selected talk about how to use the power reach when you're overreaching um, and things like that. Um, yes, there are stories about uh, Magic Johnson and Donald Trump and Gretzky and Paul Allen and Dick Clark, Little Richard Simon, Cal, a bunch of people. And But all of them have this connection to what I call the power of reach. You know, I, I believe um, the more we try, the luckier we get. So um, I hope this book is uh, entertaining, but I really hope it's inspiring as well. You know, I, so growing up, you at a young age, you knew you wanted to get into television and you applied to be at the CBC. Um, you knew what you wanted to do, but but they weren't really ready for you when you came <laughs> in. T talk about your start at the CBC and how you kind of talked yourself into a position that didn't really exist. Well, you know, the expression ignorance is bliss. Well, that was me, really ignorant. I didn't understand how the business worked, uh, but I knew I wanted in. And, um, you know, um, you said I applied, you know, to CBC. Well, I actually stalked somebody. <laughs> you know, I actually waited outside. Uh, I mean, you could probably get arrested for what I did, you know, today. But I was actually waited outside someone's office who uh, went to my university. He went to the, you know, my university 25 years ago. And it was my one connection. I had no real connection to the entertainment business other than I wanted to work in it. Uh, I love sports. And sports is my second love for television's my first but at the time you know that's where i thought i would fit in that's where i thought i would work and i literally waited outside of uh, someone's office for five hours or so um and uh till he came out and um i got him in the hallway and said hey can i have 10 minutes of your time and he said i'll give you five and it turned out to be 90 minutes and uh then he began to tell me that um you know, I, he, well, he asked me, he actually asked me a question. He said, what, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a producer. And he said, well, that's a good life goal. You know, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. And he goes, well, you know, that ignorance, ignorance again. And he goes, that's, uh, Enthusiasm. that's not the way, yeah, that's not the way it works. He said, you have to be a production assistant. You got to work in local news. And then if you're lucky, you'll get the national news and be a production. Assistant. And then if you're lucky, you'll get, be, become a production assistant network sports. And, and I said, well, how long does that take? And he goes, you want the fast track? And I go, sure. And he goes, five years. And I go, well, I'm not interested. Once again, ignorant, not knowing any better. And uh, But I did enough in that meeting to get a meeting with his boss, who was the head of CBC Sports. And yeah, the story is covered in the book. And it's, it's, it's all kind of nuts. It's all kind of like, when I think back on it, I can't actually believe it, believe it happened to me. Um, and you know, six months after graduating, I was the replay director on Hockey Night in Canada. And you guys know, um, Hockey Night in Canada for a Canadian boy is like, uh, that's that's Monday Night Football times 10. So years later, I'm doing the L.A. Olympics, my first time in L.A. And then if things aren't crazy enough, they make me head of the sports division when I'm 28. And um, anyhow, it's 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 just like I said, I. I Everything that's worked for me is when I put myself out there, when I wasn't afraid to take chances, you know, when I wasn't afraid to express my ideas. Every time I walk into a meeting, I don't, you know, whether it was with Dick Clark, who ended up moving me to L.A., or whether it was that first meeting at CBC Sports, I walked in there with actual ideas. I actually walked in with like what my white paper because, I, you know, people say they have good ideas. So I said, you know what, I'll just try this. And, you know, and, you know, the funny thing is. When I had that big meeting with CBC, the second meeting with CBC, and here's a story that's not in the book, but there's a when I had my second meeting at, at CBC, um, you know, I had to impress these people, and I was handing out these papers that I had written about, you know, what what I would do with CBC Sports. That's in the book. That part of the story is, but what's not in the book is when I became 
head of CBC Sports. My first night, I'm sitting in the in the corner office, and right away, I want to look into everybody's personnel files. What do they make? What are whether what are the complaints that have been filed? And I find my file. I found my file, and in it is like all the human resource, the whole human resources paperwork from years ago, and the papers that I handed out as that lunatic 22 year old was in the file. And it was just, it was just, you know, it was kind of cool that it went full circle. And uh, so anyhow, you know, it's like, like I said, all of this came from extending myself and something happened to me and we're not going to reveal it today, but something happened to me, Jason, I appreciate you reading the book and thank you, Jeff, for having me on. You know, something happened to me when I was nine years old and I, when I retraced my steps, I believe that that changed my life. I grew up the sh shyest of all kids. My pa I was the kid that my parents worried about. Would not, you know, we moved five miles away to another suburb and it took me weeks before I left the house. I mean, I had some real issues with that. But then something happened to me when I was nine that forced me to step out of my comfort zone. And, and listen, when you're nine years old, you don't realize, you know, what's going on subconsciously, but it, it, it changed me. And then when I really reach, like I said, when I retrace my steps, I look back and I know from that moment when I was nine years old. So readers, you got to find out what happened to me. It's kind of well, crazy. Well, here, here's my curiosity about you going through your own personnel file and looking at the stuff that you had when you were 22. So the person yeah. that you are now and the person that you are when you read those files, what, do, what would you have thought if, if, if that 22 year old had come into your office? Well, um, listen, I'm, I'm. I believe in um, passion and I believe in intensity. And when I see a young person come up who's got, who's really going for it, right away I take notice. Um, the worst thing that someone could do when they come into my office is number one, like things that kill the deal right away is that if you don't know a lot about the company that you're applying to, that's, you know, that does it for me. And then I always appreciate someone who puts themselves out there, someone who's done their homework and who puts themselves out there, because that that tells me how passionate they are. They, and um, and so, you know, it's one of the great things about doing the book and and um, is, is that I hope it inspires people to reach. And, and, I, and I did it because every time I lecture, every time I go to universities and talk to 20 year olds, 20 something year olds, it always comes up this power of reach. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I, like I said, I really hope it, 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 it inspires people. Um, and, um, yeah, I, it's funny, you know, one of the things about running a company like I do, which is for 23 years and, and being, you know, I was head of CBC sports 35 years ago. So I've been in a position of leadership. Uh, I love the process of mentoring people. I love that. And, you know, it gives me such great joy when I look back at some of the people who started our, at our company as production assistants, who are executive producers, who started at our company as associate producers, who are running networks. And, um, you know, so that that was one of the prime motivators for me writing the book. I, I'm hoping that this book is, is, is the beginning of a new chapter in my life where I spend more of my time um, mentoring and, and giving it back and paying it forward. And listen, I, I've done 200 shows for 50 networks in, in this 23 year old company and prior to that thousands of hours of sports programming and yes i still love it but i want to i want to shift the balance a little bit more and and spend more time like i said giving back in fact all of my proceeds from the book are going to the reach foundation uh the reach foundation is a, a is a thing i set up which gives money to half a dozen charities who uh lift people up in some way so that that they can reach in their own lives um you know, there's a lot to, to to be learned from this book and from you. When you're when you're involved in being a producer, you have to make a lot of decisions, and sometimes you have to take some risks. And sometimes those 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 stories are actually really good stories. Could you just tell us a little bit about the story of of, of the decision that you made related to Wayne Gretzky and, and what happened with with Mr. Cherry? <laughs> Well, me and me and Mr. Cherry, you know, I could I could write a book of my life. You know, me and Mr. Cherry could be a whole other book, and uh, I can tell you some stuff that's not in the book because um, it's crazy. Because I've almost suspended him. I actually suspended him once, but we got into a lot of. I was always like, "Please, Don, don't make me suspend you." Every time I suspend you, I like I'm, I'm going to be that most hated man in the country. Please don't do that. You're so beloved. 
Um, but um, yeah, I mean, when I was uh, I was doing the Summer Olympics in Korea, and um, and um, you know, I knew they they had told me I was going to be head of the sports division when I came back, and I saw I was watching CNN in my hotel room in Seoul, and I saw that Gretzky got traded, you know, the you know one of the biggest trades in hockey ever, and he got traded from the Edmonton Oilers to the Los Angeles Kings and Los Angeles Kings, and in Canada, I mean, you know, I, there was no no bigger news story, than so I I. I call. I, I immediately went for my hockey schedule and saw that Edmonton was playing, or LA was playing in Edmonton. The first time that Wayne would return in another uniform to Edmonton, in um, you know, in October. And I called the head of CBC, uh, the head of the CBC, um, and I said, "Hey, listen, uh, we should be doing this game. Everyone's going to want to see what how the crowd reacts and everything else like that." And they said, great idea, great idea. Um, you're, but by the way, you're not head of sports yet. And I go, I, I know, but I'm going to be when I get back. So can we just try this thing? And uh, and they said, um, well, let's see when it's on. And they go, well, it's on um, um, It's on a Wednesday night. Hockey night in Canada is Saturday night. You know, we, we don't do games on Wednesday. And I, and I go, well, it's time to make an exception. We need to try this. And and they go, well, l- let's see what, what you're scheduled against. And I go, you're scheduled against the World Series. And I go, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This Wayne Gretzky in a regular season hockey game coming back to Edmonton is bigger than the World Series in Canada, right? Right. And they said, hey, this is going to be your first big decision as the head of sports. I said, yes, because I started as head of sports on October 6th. So I go to tell Cherry <laughs> that we're doing this game. And he goes, I'm not going. And he says, I, I don't want to go. He goes, I a hockey man. He's, you know, Don's a traditional hockey man. He's a purist, and and it, and also with the broadcast, hockey night Canada Saturday night eight o'clock, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going. Um, anyhow, he he went, <laughs> and uh, but he wasn't happy, and um, you know, in Ron McLean's book, Ron McLean and Don. Ron McLean is the co-host or the host, and Don is Don because there's no category to put Don in. Anyhow. Um, and it's in Ron, it's in Ron's book that how how much they didn't want to go to the game. And uh, as it turned out, the game um, beat um, uh, the the game beat the World Series. So the the Gretzky game beat the World Series, uh, not by a lot, but just enough to to make it a good move. And I mean, what else was CBC going to put on up against the World Series anyhow? So, but the thing with Cherry, I'll just tell you one other quick story of, of something that's not in the book. So exclusive to the uh, the heart of sports, Philadelphia. <laughs> Here you go. Haven't told the story in years. So so okay. So here's what happened. So I was you know as head of sports, you know that Gretzky game really worked, and I was trying to do more special edition games and double headers. Now people in Canada like you know it's they're still doing it. So whatever I did 35 years ago is still going on. There's double header. They've shifted hockey night in Canada to seven 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 thirty. You know, and so they can get the late games in. It's a whole change in schedule, but. Honestly, it was it was a fight. It was a fight with the owners of the teams. Anyhow, there was a game. I said, you know what? I want to try to do a Sunday afternoon game. I want the, the LA Kings were playing the Quebec Nordiques in um and and I and I went to Don because you know Don is this one of the he's one of the big stars of the show. I said, Don, you gotta go to Quebec. And he didn't love Quebec, that province. So um <laughs> not as much as as he disliked the 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 Scandinavian and Russians, but that's a whole other thing. Right behind that, probably Quebec. So I said to Don, you're going to Quebec? And he goes, um, no. And once again, I said, Don, you have a contract. You need to go. And he went. And so I'm watching the game at home. The game, unfortunately, is not a very good game. It's a blowout, as a matter of fact. And I think the Kings were, I, I can't remember the exact score, but the Kings were up like six to one after the first period. The game's kind of over. And we go into the first intermission for Don Cherry's segment, which is called Coach's Corner. And and he said, and he's talking, and Ron McLean goes, what do you think of the game? And Don Cherry says, this is what happens when Hockey Night in Canada is on a Sunday. And he looks into the camera, and he goes, right, Arthur? And and I'm sitting at home with my wife. And 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 Ron McLean, you know, being the consummate professional, goes, you mean Ron? He goes, no, I mean Arthur. And he's like pointing his finger. I'm sitting there like my my chest is like like tightening up. Uh, you know what do you do? What do you do? And I think that was the time he got suspended. I know it was once. So, um, but anyhow, um, but you know he 
he was a he, he was a lovely man. You know, of course, after he apologized, and he says, I, you know, I just lost it and whatever. And I was just so upset that we had a lousy game on. And I was in Quebec on a Sunday. And I said, a lot of people like to be in Quebec on a Sunday. What are you complaining about? Anyway. So, yeah, but but look look at the bright side. There are people that believe the TV's talking to them. It was actually talking to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, and if people read the book, they can see about the first Gretzky game back, the exchange that you ended up having with him in the elevator, which we'll leave yeah. for the book. But I wanted to ask you, you eventually, you say you shifted to non-scripted, but if I look back at what you were doing when you were covering the Olympics with Ben Johnson and Carl Lewis, you were doing non-scripted storytelling all the way back when you were covering sports. Can you talk about how that seems to have been the genesis for like, we like to find the story behind the sports. It seems like that's what you're always looking to do. And that paid off for you with Ben Johnson in the Olympics. Can you talk about that? Well, I'm, I'm always, you know, when I was a sports guy, I was kind of like an entertainment guy doing sports and I, and I love stories and, you know, maybe it's because I grew up in a house filled of, with women, with, with uh, two sisters. And so now I have two daughters and none of them who are sports fans, but I always was trying to reach out to them. And maybe, maybe I'm just a big mush ball because I just want, I just want to connect, you know, people to the emotional side of sports and tell great stories. You know, sports was a great vehicle for that. I mean, I love doing the games. Of course, I love covering the games. But you know what? I really was more excited about doing the opens and doing the story behind what was going on. That's what really excited me. And uh, that's, you know, um, you know, when I'm working in when I was working in sports, I missed, um, I wanted to do entertainment programming. And then I went, when I went into entertainment programming with Dick Clark, I missed doing sports. And then when I went back to sports at Fox sports, where I was head of programming and production, you know, I missed entertainment. And, and that's why my company is, has been great because I have the ability to do everything. And, you know, the show that we do American Ninja warrior is kind of like the blending of both of my worlds. And, I mean, it's a it's a shock that we're in our 15th season of this obstacle course show, but um, but uh, but you know um, you know listen, some I believe that you know storytelling is storytelling whether you're working in sports and entertainment, and it's not a coincidence that a lot of the people who work at at my company are ex Fox Sports alums, because I like sports producers have to get the story in the moment and they have to react in the moment. You know when you're when you're producing an entertainment program, you a lot of times you're creating. The fire, and then you're covering the fire, and 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 when you're in live sports, you know you're just reacting to it. So um, anyhow, I, you know what? I completely forgot what your question is, but this is, uh, this I was, is I, it, it happens all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff Jeff doesn't listen to my questions either, so don't worry about it. You fit right in on the show. I, I was just sort of asking you you approached that games where you were covering the yeah. Ben Johnson Carl Lewis yeah. uh, competition in the story it was. And then eventually you got to tell a totally different story yeah. of Ben Johnson, which you all won awards for. Yeah. When did you know that the story that you had wasn't the story that it was going to be? Yeah. I mean, listen, it, it's all about understanding the audience. It's, uh, it's something that I've always believed in. And I learned even more when I worked with Dick Clark about how he stayed connected to the whole country and not just what was going on in LA and what's going on in New York. And so I, I honestly felt that when Ben tested positive, um, we, which, you know, you know, you know, this, Jason, it was it was I, I stopped covering the Olympics and fo totally focused on the, the fallout of, of, of Ben testing positive. And I and I took a lot of crap from it in our control room with my colleagues. And they were saying, Arthur, you got to get back to covering the Olympics. And I said, no, no, no. This is the story. And I said, you know, really shows about sports generally don't do as well as the sports themselves. You know, pregame shows, they do well, but they don't do as well as the game. You know, um, the game always is the thing. But in this case, the game, the games <laughs> weren't the thing. And and like I said, everybody was, uh, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people were were on me. And I I just trusted my gut. And, you know, that night when Ben Johnson won the gold medal and beat Carl Lewis. Um, it was the highest rated night in Canadian television history. And then three days later, Ben testing positive, uh, beat it. And that became the highest rated night in, in Canadian television history. And that record held for a long time. And it was, it was broken in 2010 when, when Canada beat us in the gold medal game in hockey in the winter Olympics. 
uh, which I still think has the record, but I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. But I've, I've been living in the States for 30 years. But uh, anyhow, but I but I know that like somebody somebody had to tell me that the record was broken. I, and I was records are meant to be broken. I was OK with it, especially because Canada won the gold medal. By the way, <laughs> I, I, I have I have dual citizenship. I root for the USA in everything, in except everything, Canada. except hockey. hockey. There's Not- Canadians. That's all, that's all we got, man. That's all we got. We got wait, hockey. Wait, wait. What about curling? We got yeah. curling, but no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of the questions that I had and that I always, you know, we've talked to other producers about before is the struggle of, yes, the, as you talked about before, the game itself is the story, mm-hmm. but the storytelling has become a much larger part of of sports on TV than it used to be. I mean, you see things like 30 for 30 and, and, and those kinds of things all the time. Is, is there ever a struggle as a producer to say, I don't want to overwhelm the event with, with a backstory? Yes. Yes. And, and yes, there is, there is a chance you can, there, not a chance. It happens. It happens. You, you have, to, I mean, it's all about the pacing of the show. There's a little bit of a science behind that. Um, it's hard to define you know, um, in a short conversation, but there, but, but you're right. It, 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 and, and, you know, there is a tendency sometimes for people to overproduce and, and please get on with the event. You're killing me, you know, like, like enough, enough. And I feel like, you know, not every store, not every Olympic package needs to be someone who's sick or overcome something. And you can, you can overwhelm an audience. It's something, listen, we face it on American Ninja Warrior all the time. There are times when we don't run packages on certain athletes because it's not warranted and we feel like we can cover their story with a quick soundbite or just a quick setup. Um, and yeah, it's it's really about pacing pacing your show. You have to do enough, but you know, um, you're right, Jeff. You know, you can you can do too much. And so um it's something that we measure, it's something that we do research, you know, we do research on too, but you have to trust your gut. You have to trust your gut because a lot of times the even the research, you know, the research sometimes says too many packages, too many profiles, which I never believe because um, they're saying that 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 moment that you saw was only made bigger because you knew something about that person because you actually cared about them. I mean, there's no logical reason for an obstacle course show to be on prime time at NBC. Come on. There's, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And had we pitched it to NBC, it would never have been on. It was a, through a strange set of circumstances that we ended up on NBC. And it, it was just, a, honestly, it was a stroke of luck. Some, listen, I believe we make, our good, we make our good fortune. Sometimes when you're reaching, good things happen. And, and that's exactly what happened with Ninja Warrior. I still can't believe we're on NBC and we've been nominated for seven, seven Emmy Awards, considering that the show was a, a little show on a cable network. And how pr- um, how proud are you of, of trusting your gut to make that decision and where it ended up? Um, yeah, no, I'm proud. I'm pr- sure. Of course, I'm proud about it. You know, it's like you actually you know, put more into that show, right? If I remember with the prep, uh, you wanted more from the the network, and you did more to make American Ninja Warrior right. pop. Correct? You did your own investing of that. Yeah. Well, I be- I, I believed in it. I guess. Yes. Uh, yeah. We put our own money into it because we had one shot at being um, this trial. It wasn't even really a trial. It was just an act of synergy for Comcat. American Ninja Warrior started on this network called G4. Network doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and 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 uh, I was happy. I was happy doing that. Like, you know, to use a sports analogy, sometimes you, you have network home runs and sometimes you have singles on smaller networks. And I'm okay with it. It's part of the portfolio. I was happy to do the show on G4, I'm happy to, you know, uh, have that, ha- have another series. And, but while we were doing what I think was our third season, Comcast buys NBC, Comcast owns E and, uh, Comcast owns Philadelphia. No, no, no I'm kidding. <laughs> Comcast owns E. Comcast owns E. As someone and who has my uh, office across the street from the two huge buildings that they have, yeah, they do. There you go. <laughs> we can see there them out go. the window of the station. I, I know, I know where I'm talking to. Anyhow, Comcast owns E and G4. And, um, and, and so as an act of synergy, purely as an act of synergy, never, ever expecting we're going to be on NBC. That's nuts. So we just said, please put this one episode of Ninja on, um, you know, um, on, on NBC. And, you know, Jason, you correctly pointed out, we went to NBC and said, listen, we want to broaden the show out. We want to do more packages. We want to dress the show up. 
And, you know, we asked NBC for some money too. And they said, uh, no, it's fine. We'll just take the show. And like NBC was kind of writing this show off. Like it's a one-off. It's never going to be on our air again. And, and, and anyhow, we invested our own money and, and made the show a little, little more special. And um, the show goes on, wins its time period. And then NBC says, let's do more. And then we're in our 15th season. Fast forward. Crazy, crazy, yeah, crazy, yeah. crazy. You talk about following the research. I drive Jeff crazy with ratings. Uh, that's not his bag, but I am very fascinated by the changing media landscape. As somebody who in that 88 Olympics was taking VHS tapes out for people to run stories that now calls this the golden age of television with streaming and so many avenues and outlets. Can you talk about some of both the opportunities that are out there, but also the challenges for the media industry as people change the way they consume the product? Well, it's really hard to get noticed. It's really hard to have a big primetime network hit. Um, sports is the one thing that, you know, conquers all. But but in the general entertainment space, it's very, very difficult to um, to have a, a big broadcast network hit. You know, I'm grateful that, you know, we have Hells in its 22nd season and Ninja in its 15th and and a bunch of other shows that are long running shows. Um, but I. I know it's possible to have a I know I certainly know it's possible to have a hit, a hit television show. I don't know how many shows that they're going to be out there that last that long, you know, that go that long anymore. I just it's it's very hard for me to see that. But I know it's possible. It's definitely possible to have a bigger network hit. However, I believe that you've got to really take risks and you've got to go very high concept. Anything that's derivative or anything that feels like a Hell's Kitchen ripoff or a Ninja ripoff or a Bachelor ripoff or a Survivor ripoff does not work. So stop doing that. That does not work. Everything that we're talking about with networks nowadays are things that are very different than what's on the air. Just like Hell's Kitchen was. 2004, no successful network food shows on television. No one knows who Gordon Ramsay was. And it was a big gamble. The show sat on the shelf for six months until we asked, begged to get to get it on the air. Ninja Warrior, well, you know the story. Never, there has never been an obstacle course show in prime time. So I believe that the next great idea is coming from something like that on a broadcast. Listen, Mass Singer, not our show. Big risk. It worked. You know? And you know, as far as streaming goes, there's a ton of opportunities for us as producers. That's the good news, is that, you know. There are years when certain certain genres, or when I when I think back on the past, I should say, but um, like ten years ago, you know, this game shows are in, or documentaries are in, and you know, genres come and go. Now everything's in, everything's in. So you just got to find a place, you know, where to put it, and uh, and that's exciting. And we love working, you know, we love working with everybody. You know, I do the floors lava with Netflix, and you know, I have a, pr a project coming up with Roku on uh, with the WWE. Uh, which is kind of like a hard knocks of the WWE, hard knocks like the HBO show in terms of oh, style. Oh, Jason, Jason is going to want you back on to talk about that. Jeff, I didn't ask him, okay? <laughs> but one of his biggest success stories of American Ninja Warrior, Casey Canizero, is now one of their stars on yeah. Monday Night Raw. And so yeah. I didn't go there, Jeff, but I could have. So, Arthur, I spared Jeff for that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... it's uh, I'm K Casey changed the sport of Ninja. You know, she just changed at that moment when she goes up the the warp wall, all five feet of her, 98 pounds. No woman had ever climbed the warp wall on American Ninja Warrior, but no one under five, six had ever climbed the warm wall. Warp man wall. or woman. Man um, or woman. So it was just, it was just insane. And she changed it. You know, women enrollment went up 30 to 40% the next year and our ratings went up. And, and, and because all of a sudden this little show that was starting to work on NBC you know, she was on the Today Show and people were saying, what is this thing? And now, you know, it's so funny. You know, we came from a male network, NBC, when they first heard about this act of synergy was like, you know, this is a guy show. And it's not. It's a family show. Kids watch the show. You know, it's so funny to me. Um, when I say funny, I mean, funny, exciting to me <laughs> that Ninja is now it's now a sport that kids now. I hear this all the time. It goes, I'm, I'm, I don't play soccer. I do ninja. I go, are you kidding me? I mean, the ninja gyms that are all over the country and, and you know, ninja birthday parties. And there's ninja coaches. Like, there's baseball coaches. That's it's, what my six-year-old wants to do. He wants me to find him a ninja class to go I, and be in. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Look, we, we really appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time to tell your story. Before we go, though, we always talk to, to people in sports about how they use their platforms to, to better the communities they're in. And you're doing that through the REACH Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about the REACH Foundation before you go? Yeah, I mean, essentially, um, you know, like I said, I started it when, uh, you know, I never did this book to make money. I did this book to get the message out there and to inspire people. And, you know, with that in mind, I said, you know what, I'm going to set up a foundation. And I, you know, the advance, you know, you know, when you're an author, you get an advance. I was lucky to get an advance on the book. And immediately I took the advance and put it into the foundation. And hopefully if the book does well enough and people buy it, then we'll get some more money. And that'll all go into the foundation. It'll probably become my family foundation because um, that's the way I see it going. And uh, but essentially um, the, the foundation gives money to. Um, half a dozen or so charities, all who, all of who lift people up in some way so that they can reach in their own life. Um, and um, yeah, and that's it. I mean, you know, one of the great gifts happened to me and I, I, I you know, I appreciate you letting me on, letting me on and, and, and tell and sharing this story, you know, before the, before the book had come out, which was last week, um, a couple of months earlier, I did the audio book. And so I'm sitting there doing the audio book and, and it's, you know, it's, it's four days, it's seven hours a day. And the one person who has no choice to, to hear your book is the audio engineer. Everybody <laughs> listening today and you guys, you have a choice. You could buy the book, you could not buy the book. Um, but the audio engineer, he has no choice. It's his job to sit there and listen to the book. And every day I go in there and the guy's, you know, doesn't say much. He's, you know, you're popping your peas, or you stand a little closer to the mic, you stand far away from your mic. And I'm going, I'm doing my thing. He goes up for lunch. I go up for lunch. We don't go out together. It's okay. He's doing his job. And, and I, you know, at the end of the session, I, I'm, I'm packing up my stuff. And he, he comes over to me and he goes, you changed my life. And I go, what are you talking about? And, and he goes, I realized I wasn't reaching enough. I was so inspired by your book that that I've decided I'm changing the course of direction of what I'm doing with my life. And he, he goes, I, 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 I just want to do more and, and listening to you, you know, and it goes on and it goes on and on and on. And I, I was kind of overwhelmed. And, you know, I hugged the guy, maybe, maybe a little bit too forward, but I hugged him <laughs> because I was like, so like, I was so like, wow, that's amazing. What a blessing. And honestly, guys, you know, and I may have said this before, I don't know, because I'm rambling, but this is what I want to do with this chapter of my life. This is where, you know, this is what I want to do. And so the book, I hope, hopefully it inspires people, you know, and, and, um, Hey, listen, if you use the book as a doorstop, you're still helping charity. Come on, man. So, there you go. Uh, That's the pitch. <laughs> Help charity. Make my book a doorstop. The book is reach hard lessons and learn truths from a lifetime in television. Arthur Smith, continued success, and thanks so much for giving us the time to hear all about it. Well, thank you guys for letting me ramble and having me on. I appreciate you.